So thanks, Liv, and hi, everybody. Um, so today we're going to introduce uh, React Native Navigation. It's an um, open source library. We've written it Wix. And this, this talk is going to be uh, an entry-level talk to the library. Uh, we're going to go over some basic concepts, introduce the API. If some of you have experience with the library and we're expecting perhaps something a bit more advanced, um, then we're going to leave that to a different talk. And with that, let's start. Uh, hi, my name is Guy. I'm an Android developer at Wix. I've been at Wix for the past three and a half years. And for the past two and a half years, I've mostly worked on React Native navigation. That's not my dog. All right. So before we start, I kind of want to take uh, the time to talk about basically what is navigation? Uh, what does it mean? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? So to me, navigation is, is simply how our users navigate our app and how they transition from one destination, one content, to another destination. And that's all how they transition through the app, how they, uh, how they move on through the flows. Um, there are a couple of important requirements for a navigation library. Um, one of them is that it should feel uh, familiar and natural to our users. Once it doesn't feel familiar, our users, as they have high expectations, they start to notice that something isn't working right, something isn't performing how they are expecting. And for example, uh, if, we're, if we're talking about familiarity, then on iOS, when you push screens, our users are expecting that they can slide, kind of slide through, uh, slide the screen and go back. Uh, on some libraries, that's just not working. So, and then they, they become frustrated. Uh, another important thing is that a library shouldn't, a navigation library shouldn't be too uh, obtrusive. It should be, it should take away the attention from the content that you are presenting on the screen because at the end of the day that's basically what you want your user to they want you want them to interact with your content your screens um, for example if you're displaying a list on the screen and your user starts scrolling down that means his intent is to become exposed to more items in that list he's interested he wants to see more content so a good library a good navigation solution would kind of hide the top navigation bar because the user's intent is to see more content. He doesn't want, want to navigate to a different destination. He wants to see more content. Um, so that was kind of an introduction to navigation. Um, and I'll kind of go over uh, the process of building the library at Wix, kind of do a quick overview of how we ended up writing that library, this library. So our story with React Native and navigation starts in early 2016. Um, React Native was just uh, released uh, to open source. I think it was version 0 0.16 and Android was just, Android support was just introduced. And we quickly evaluated it because as Lev explained, it really fits the Wix culture and and how Wix is built because we have lots of front-end developers. So we figured, yay, finally we can build a mobile application. Um, so we started experimenting with uh, navigation solutions which were available to us at the time. And the first was uh, Navigator iOS, which kind of goes against everything that React Native stands for, and it's available only for iOS. So we couldn't use that because what are we going to do for Android? Next, we evaluated Navigation Experimental, which remained experimental it w until it was deprecated. It's a JavaScript solution, and it suffered for many, it had many flaws and drawbacks, and we figured, okay, we have the resources, let's fix those uh, issues, uh, but we failed. <laughs> so what we ended up doing is actually developing our own solution and we understood that basically what's missing, React Native is great, but what the missing part was a native navigation solution. We want our app to feel native, so let's implement it. 
So development started around uh, early 2016, and we supported the first version until uh, late 2018. And, and this talk will be about the second version, and I will explain why we ended up rewriting the library. So it had a couple of flaws. First, it was developed while we were still evaluating React Native. So development was kind of organic. You know, we were developing our app, and when whenever we missed, we were missing a feature, we just went and, and implemented it. And we didn't really have a plan. There was no like a long-term plan. Just features were added uh, every once in a while. Um, also, it was tightly coupled to the Wix product. There were lots of uh, lots of small details which were actually Wix design requirements and since it's an open source project that's kind of out of the question you can't have that and the last thing which kind of forced us to rewrite the libraries it was untested the library was actually started as a hackathon project uh, so who writes tests in hackathons well not me um, and eventually we reached a point where we couldn't progress, we couldn't add new features because we just had more and more bugs and more and more regressions. Um, and we, we sat down and thought, okay, wh what are we gonna do? So, and the only viable uh, solution was to just rewrite the library. So that's what we did. And, and we really wanted to basically implement uh, all the lessons that we've learned from the first version so it's kind of it's 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 actually fairly similar to the first version with just a few tweaks and also it's tested great so we can scale we can move forward accept pull requests as it's open source that's really fun um, so let's talk about the core the few core principles which guided us when we rewrote the library so the first is um, is due to the reasons Lev mentioned, a minimal footprint on the JavaScript thread. Basically, React Native, it's fun, it's great, but there are a few bottlenecks which really hurt performance. And when you're evaluating React Native, you immediately notice them. So the first is basically that JavaScript is a single thread environment. You really have to be conscientious when you run any work on the JavaScript thread. So we realized we had to offload Every, everything, almost uh, everything we can to native. All, every work we need to do relating to navigation state has to be done in native so we can keep the JavaScript thread free for our users. Um, well, as I mentioned, the state has to be in native basically for that reason. Um, the second principle that guided us, well, when we first wrote the library, we were all uh, native developers. And if you're familiar with the native APIs, they're all imperative. You start an activity, you, uh, you uh, start a fragment, you add a fragment. And in order, because we wanted to keep the library, uh, the footprint lean on JavaScript thread, then we, re we realized that all we need to do is basically expose those APIs, which are available to us in native, to JavaScript. So there's no point in going declarative. We'll go imperative. And this was, this was kind of a big thing because React Native kind of pr strongly promotes a declarative approach to everything. But we said, no, we're going to do that imperative. Um, and the last is an unopinionated API. Basically, the first version uh, was, as I said, was tightly coupled to uh, Wix uh, logic. And we really did lots of like kind of like black magic under the hood. For example, when you uh, showed a modal, we immediately added a stack to it. Uh, later on, I'll explain what that means. But that's not that's not true. Uh, that's not needed. We don't necessarily need a stack of screens when you show a modal component. Um, and the problem this introduces is that it makes the API unpredictable. You do one thing, you do one action, and you get something else. Sometimes it's nice and it works out for you, but sometimes it doesn't, and that's re really frustrating. Um, so today, React Native navigation is used at Wix by over 70 developers. Apparently, we're 71. We recruited someone. Um, over two th 270 col collaborators. Um, most of them are, are from outside of Wix, which is amazing. 
And we have 9.7 thousand stars on GitHub, if it means anything. And 350,000 monthly downloads on NPM. And it turns out we're the sixth fastest growing open source project uh, in 2018, according to GitHub, which is really nice. Um, now I'd like to invite you, Gev, to continue. So, hello everyone, my name is Yogev, and this is also not my cat. <laughs> I'm an iOS developer at Wix, and I'm working for the past two years on React Native Navigation. Uh, there are many JavaScript solutions out there. So why and when you should consider using a native solution, and what, what features are lacking in the, uh, those JavaScript solutions that we do have in native solutions. In, a, yeah, in the native solution, let's try to answer those questions. So what are the advantage of native uh, navigation solution over the J JavaScript ones? So the first one is native look and feel. Uh, when you go to the App Store or Google Play and download an app, uh, you immediately can feel, you can see uh, if this app is native or not. You can see if the gesture responds as it should, should and, um, and how smooth the animations are. So in React Native Navigation, we use the native views of iOS and uh, uh, Android frameworks. And this allows us to get all the implementations that are already there and to get the feel that any other app has, native app. Um, so this is important, I think, because we want our users to have the best experience. And we want them to get what they're already used to. So the second one is smaller layout hierarchy, which contributes to improved performance. Um, as we know, uh, uh, React, React state change and then a render function creates a shadow DOM, a new shadow DOM. And then React need to uh, figure out or to calculate how, how uh, the cha this change uh, between the new shadow DOM and the old shadow DOM. And the bigger our layout hierarchy will be, these calculations will take longer and will um, uh, make our performance worse. So uh, in React Native Navigation, each screen has its own React view. So this means we have smaller layout hierarchy. And when state update, uh, it will not need to go over all the hierarchy, which contributes to improved performance. And the last one is reduce overdraw. So in React Native Navigation, previous views are detached from the hierarchy. This means they, they are not draw on the screen. And in any other JavaScript solution, as we will see in the next slide, um, all the last, all the previous views, which are not even visible to the user are getting drawn and this cause uh, not that good performance obviously so here we can see react navigation implementations uh, which is JavaScript implementation and not native so you can see this app with a stack and two screens are being pushed. Now using the Xcode UI view hierarchy, we can see that all the screens are loaded. We can see that there is a large, uh, there is a, a large hierarchy and all those views are getting drawn even when the user, the user doesn't see it. It shouldn't be presented.
And in React Navigation, we see React Native Navigation, we see the same app. Two screens are being pushed. And again, using the UI view hierarchy. This is slow. Okay, so we see that only the top view is present is drawn and the, the layer, layout hierarchy is much smaller. Uh, it is also worth mentioning that there is a downside in using React Native Navigation. Uh, the integration is more complex and it will require you to, uh, to write native code, uh, to mess with native code and configurations, uh, but we think it's worth it. All right. Um, thanks, Yogev. So, where's the, where's the? All right. So next up, we're going to talk about uh, layouts. We're going to go in the next few sections. We're going to go over the API. Um, and and the first thing we'll we'll start with layouts. Um, so in React, our content is basically it, it's re it's written inside a React component, and if you remember, I mentioned uh, I focused on the imperative API, and while we are f uh, promoting an imperative API in React, we're used to a declarative API, and we we declare our layouts in JS6, but here because we we're only going to declare our layouts once and then send those layout declarations to native, the simplest way we found was using a, a JSON. So let's see how we declare our React component. The first parameter we have is an ID, and I noted here it's optional, but if you do uh, provide it, you'll use this ID to interact with this component, and we see uh, examples for that later on. And the second parameter, it's also very important, and that's the, the component name. And in the comment, I, know I mentioned something about app registry. If you're familiar with vanilla React Native, then you're probably familiar with this line, app registry register component. And this line in vanilla React Native is written once. And the first parameter is a key. The second parameter is a generated function, which returns uh, a component class. And wh what, what does this line mean? So basically, because in React Native navigation, each screen is uh, contained in its own uh, React root view, then we need, to, we need to register those screens multiple times. We need to register all our screens and treat them as if each screen is a, an app within itself. So while in, React, in vanilla React Native, we write th this line once, in React Native Navigation, we need to register each screen. And that's why when we declare a component, we pass its key, as if we were starting an entire React Native application. And the other uh, parameters are options, which are used for styling and props, which will be available to this component. Now, let's see uh, what we can how, we, how we can use this component, because by itself, it's, it's pretty boring. Um, so this is how we declare a stack. And just like the component, it has an ID. But it also has children. A stack can contain multiple children, because you can push multiple children into it. Um, and the API is fairly similar. It's basically a standard stack API. You can push screens into the stack, and when you push a screen, it is added to the top of the stack. When you pop a screen, the topmost uh, screen is always removed. We don't remove screens from the middle of the stack because we think this creates unpredictability. If your user pushes a couple of screens and then you remove one of them from the middle and then he goes back, he expects to see a screen, he doesn't, then he gets confused. Um, next, I'd like to take a short break from layouts and let's focus on commands, how we actually interact with our layouts. So we've declared a stack in the previous slide and we gave it an, an ID, home. And let's see how we can interact with it. Uh, and this is an example of pushing a screen into a stack. 
uh, there, and there are a few things to note. So the first thing is that each navigation command returns a promise. This means that you can react to it, you can wait for a command to end, and only then you can, and then you can do whatever logic you want. Why is this important? Um, because React Native uses JavaScript in its single thread environment, we keep saying that over and over again, but as React Native developers, we really, we really need to be conscientious to that, uh, to that fact. We need to keep the amount of work we do whenever we push a screen to the bare minimum. So we need to be able to recognize when push commands end, and only then we can do various uh, logic, for example, contact server, fetch some data, or whatever, because we want to keep the amount of work uh, to a minimum. This way our screen can be pushed faster, and there will be no delay uh, between the actual command and when the user sees the screen uh, on his device. Next thing to uh, mention is that navigation commands are invoked statically. There is no uh, navigator or navigation in instance injected into props. You can interact with any layout from anywhere in your, in your app, in your business logic. You just need to know its ID. And if you give layouts predefined IDs, then you can interact with them from anywhere. And the last thing is that they can be observed statically. And this, is, this also uh, gives us lots of uh, flexibility. We don't need to await a uh, command we can handle the completion someplace else. Uh, we'll, we'll see how we do that later on. Let's go back to layouts. This is going to be the last layout uh, I'm going to go over. And this is uh, the a bottom tabs layout. Uh, we see an here an example of the Wix app. And we have three tabs, home, uh, chat, and account. And what are tabs uh, useful for? Usually, you will use a tab as the root component of your app and each each con the content that you display in each tab is kind of uh, independent of the content in different tabs so if you have stacks in those tabs the user can drill in can navigate to new destinations and then click on one of the other tabs and navigate to a different tab in this layout uh, example I've uh, you can see that the first uh, component is a stack uh, this is basically whenever you declare bottom tabs, you would want to have your components, the, your children as stacks, because you want to be able to push screens into it. But if we look at the second component, the second child, it's actually a simple component. That doesn't really make sense. It means that the, the second tab will have a single uh, component, and you won't be able to push screens into it. So why would we want to do that? I guess we wouldn't. But I figured I'll show it because this basically emphasizes the fact that layouts are, are, are generic, they're homogeneous. You can mix and match any type of layout anywhere. Any type of layout can be a child of any type of layout. If you have a side menu, you can put bottom tabs or a split view in your side menu if you want to. Everything works, and we're not limiting uh, uh, users. So next up is, the hi is uh, we'll talk about hierarchy. So we know how to declare layouts, and we know how to p place uh, children components within those layouts. But how do we uh, how do we add those layouts to the hierarchy to the actual layout hierarchy? So we have multiple levels, and the first one is the root level. Um, the root level is kind of the starting destination of your app. When you set root, you replace any other any previous root that was on the screen. And if there wasn't any root, then this is what where your user will will start his experience. So here we have like a, a simple example. And in the conditional, you'll see I'm checking some variable if the user is logged in. And if the user is logged in, I set uh, the home screen as root. But if he's not logged in, then I set the logging screen. So this means basically that whenever the user sees the login screen, he can't go back to a home screen or whatever. There's only at any given point only one root attached to this to the hierarchy. Um, second, uh, very common uh, used is uh, component is a modal. So we can show any type of layout in a modal. You're you're probably familiar with it because this is available also in vanilla React Native, only it's used in JS6. So here we show modals uh, again. It's a command available to us from navigation, and 
typically we would want to use modals for short-lived tasks or like uh, like an upload image flow or something which has a couple of steps or maybe alerts uh, or action sheets these are uh, components which uh, require the users um, I would say immediate attention and uh, they don't allow the user to interact with whatever is beneath the modal um, a common source of, for of uh, confusion is when should we show a modal and when should we push a screen so there's a difference between the two and I've created this illustration um, so let's try to imagine uh, an e-commerce app and there's a, s a store screen and we browse through the products and we see something that we want to buy great we click that product and we push the product info screen and yeah we're happy we want to buy that product so what do we do we show a purchase flow and we show that purchase flow in a modal and that flow has a couple of steps first one I need to type in my address okay and 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 also I, I want to mention that this we can purchase products from two places we can purchase a product from the product info screen but also from the store screen because I don't know product and I'm continuing with my flow um, adding payment info and success yeah I bought a product and what now I, I'm finished with this flow I dismiss the modal and I I'm ended up as a user right where I left off in the previous context I was where I initiated the purchase flow which in this case it, it was the product info screen but just as well it could have been the the previous screen the store screen why is this important it's because if I'm a developer and I'm working on that purchase flow it means that I know I don't need to be uh, to have any notion of where the flow initiated from I don't need to be aware of some stacks or the store screen or the product info screen I know that my flow is in a modal and when I finished with it I simply dismiss the purchase flow modal so it kind of d helps you decouple components within your app if I click once you can click twice um, so last uh, level of hierarchy is um, overlay an overlay is basically it's very simple it allows us to to position any type of layout anywhere on the screen on top of everything else modals or root components let's see how we use it in the Wix app um, so here we're in the chat tab and in the Wix app whenever a user logs in and, and uh, to my website I get this little message that I have a visitor on my site and and when I click it uh, this little component opens up and I can actually start a chat with this user but I don't have to click it and and using this uh, this showing this uh, component in overlay allows me as a user to continue navigating the app using the app perhaps switching to different uh, tabs and it doesn't abstract the content behind it all right so so styling our apps apps today are have distinct themes uh, our product managers they, they really want to create to differentiate our app from different apps and th the best way to do that is by declaring like uh, a theme a distinct theme to your app with colors fonts or whatever so to declare a theme you basically set whatever options you have you want as the default options these options will be applied to any layout and any component that we declare so in this example we see how we declare a uh, red background color to any component another option you're familiar uh, with it from uh, uh, react navigation it's to declare options statically on components and whenever this component will be displayed on the screen these options will be applied as well I think this is very easy and handy because it basically means that you declare options as closest to where you're actually where these, these options are actually going to be used and that's this screen and another another way to apply options is when we when we use those screens when we push them or show them in modals so we can pass options also 
in the command. And finally, we can, as we can update a mounted components options. Uh, so here I update my screen, uh, which is a mounted component. I update its options and I change the background color to blue. Now, I know this might seem confusing because there are various ways kind of to achieve the same, the same, uh, the same goal, which is to apply styling options. So I also have a pyramid. And and what we what this basically shows us is that as the method of applying styling options is more dynamic, those options have precedence over previously declared options. So if I'm declaring my options statically in a component, they will override whatever I declared in the default options. And the same goes for a command. If I push a screen and that screen declared whatever a, a red background color, but I can I can change the background color whenever I push that screen. Uh, so next up is events. I, I spoke about how navigation is all about how our users navigate our app, how they transition, how they explore uh, the app. And whenever a user to navigate the app, we also need to react to that. Well, we should be able to. Um, so we have a couple of events we expose. And and the set of th this set of events basically allows us to respond to any use case that we have. Um, the most important uh, uh, events I think are the lifecycle events. These are these helps us uh, know when a component appeared on the screen or disappeared on the screen. Um, why is that important? Well, if you look at this this uh, component, it basically does nothing in the constructor, right? It it registers to the event registry. Um, but that's it. But what happens if you, by mistake, you're doing some long-running task in the constructor? I don't know, you've decided to fetch some data from the server, and it's taking some time. So that component actually won't appear on the screen until you finish your, your tasks in the constructor. So, so this, this basically, this listener will be invoked once the component has actually been rendered on the screen. Um, other com other uh, events are command events. We can react to any command that uh, that we invoke, push or show modal overlay, and also to user interaction, clicking the back button or uh, bottom tabs. And I mentioned before that you can listen to events statically as well. So this is just an example of how you do it. Here uh, we've added a did appear listener. So we can now li uh, we can now react to the appearance of every component in our app. Good. So, if we manage to get you interested and you would like to uh, get start uh, using React Native navigation, you have uh, two options. So, if you're, you have an application that already uses a React Navigation and you want to migrate it to React Native Navigation, so this is the op option for you. Uh, you will need to manually install a React Native Navigation. Uh, this option, option is more complex and it will force you to mess with native code and configurations. Uh, but you can use our installation guide in uh, in our documentation. The second option is using a Yeoman generator that which we created. Uh, it's the easiest way to start. You have only to type those three command three commands, and it will bootstrap a clean project, clean React Native project with React Native Navigation installed and configured. Uh, you will need to choose the desired template, uh, desired initial template for your app, uh, whether it's bottom tab, stack, or side menu. And it will kickstart a new project within seconds. So to wrap things up, 
Um, first, if you are interested and you have questions, then you're welcome to join our chat uh, on Discord and well, also on GitHub if you have any issues. But Discord is very, you're all welcome. Uh, we have a big community and admins and people who are always willing to uh, assist. And last thing is join us. It's an open source project. Everybody's welcome. Uh, we have lots of contributors and we accept pull requests. Uh, so please do. We'd love to get contributions. And, and that's it, I think. Thank you. Um, uh, so the question, can we arrange a custom uh, animation on a screen changes? Yeah, absolutely. You can configure any uh, native view property. Uh, you can add uh, interpolation or duration, whatever you want. Um, basically, the properties that are available in native, like alpha or uh, translation x, y. Uh, so we describe uh, animation uh, with the animated component from React Native, or it's so... No, so no. So because because the MPI, API is an imperative, you declare options once, then you declare animations in a, in a JSON file, uh, in, in basically in a, in a JSON object. Uh, the way we do it is we declare animations in the default options. This way, they are, they are applied to all, all of our screens. Uh, is there some restriction uh, compared to uh, React Native Animated? No, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> okay. uh, so, and the second one. Uh, about uh, changing uh, screens, uh, for the case, you went from one screen, and uh, then you uh, add the second screen, and you change the animation one time, you have only one uh, mounted uh, screen uh, with React Native instance. All right, and so that, I'll so. Yeah, uh, it's not. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, let's imagine we have one screen with uh, some state changed, and then we have a second screen, but we should keep state uh, in the previous screen. Uh, how you handle this situation? All right, so what, was a, what, was a, what I was referring to was when you set the root component, and when you set root, you, the application only has one, one root at a given time. But what I think you are talking about is when you push screens, the previous screens, they stay mounted, but they're just detached from hierarchy. They still respond to state change. Uh, and actually, they will be rendered if, the, if their state is updated, even though they're invisible. What you can do is wire the, the lifecycle uh, uh, ev events that I showed to your uh, should component update, basically, and prevent uh, unneeded renders. But state is updated as they are still uh, mounted. A component is unmounted only when it is popped or dismissed. Uh, okay, so we uh, can handle the situation uh, when we uh, can make step back, step back, and uh, keep uh, latest state of the previous screen, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool, thank you. Thank you for the good library. I used it once. So I have a question. Uh, the first, it's not a question, but about the library. Have you seen React Native Screens library? I have. Yeah. So, so the question was, are we, have we played, have we seen React Native Screens? So, so the other major uh, navigation library is uh, React Navigation. And, and they had a major problem where previous screens or invisible screens were not detached from hierarchy. So in came uh, an enth enthusiastic developer and wrote this nice library called React Native Screens. And what it does is it kind of mimics uh, what navigation does. And it basically detaches previous screens from the hierarchy. So and this allows uh, React uh, navigation to, uh, well, this basically improves their performance quite immensely. Um, it's currently in beta, and it's an opt-in feature, feature. If you're using Expo, then it's right there. And you don't need to install anything. Um, but there's one difference, and that is in React Native Navigation, each screen is contained within its own root view. And even though you use React Native screens, your, your screens are still declared as components, and they're a part of this one huge shadow dome. 
So when they are updated, your, your, your uh, comparisons that you're doing between the previous DOM and the current DOM are, will still take lots of time. So even though we've reduced overdraw and measurements and layouting cycles in native, we're still, we still get hurt by React Native uh, architecture. That's the difference. Yeah, and another question about animations. Do you support like shard, ele shard element transitions? Like All right, so, uh, so that's, a, that's a good question. Do we support uh, shared element transition between screens? We do. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been developed uh, quite a few months ago on both platforms. But we've we stopped developing it because we wanted to focus on other features. And it's actually one of our goals for the current uh, quarter. So this quarter, we're going to continue our work on the shared element transition. And we hope to bring it to, its, uh, to, uh, to a good state. Uh, you'll be able to animate uh, any properties, text color, size, fonts, uh, position on screen uh, between uh, the root uh, push screens and also modals. Um, yeah, so it will be supported uh, shortly, I hope. Uh, thanks for the talk. I have two questions, and the first one about split view. I know that there is support for iOS, but there is no support for Android. Are you right. planning on doing something like that? Right, so we're not. We don't use the split view implementation. Uh, we don't use split view in our app. but And therefore, we don't have plans to support it ourselves. But again, if, uh, if somebody is, we wants to contribute and, and pull request it, then absolutely we'll merge it in. OK. And are you planning to support tablets or you're fine with uh, only mobile on forms, mobile form, form factor? Um, all right, so I think at Wix there's like kind of a concept that tablets are like small desktops um, and most tablet users are basically using websites. Um, most of our users use Wix through the website and they don't really require a Wix uh, mobile app. So I hope we will improve support for tablets at some point, but don't know if it's planned. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And uh, the second question is: Any plans to support Windows platform? No. Nope. Anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, because we don't have the the manpower to it, um, that that's the reason. Uh, okay, thank you for the speech. I have a question about um, overlay and um, if it stands on the, on the top of everything, uh, and also about m models. Can I show something like uh, not notification uh, on the top of overlay or on the top of? Uh right. So overlay. Uh, so the overlay is positioned on top of the root on top of any other modals. You can, once an overlay is displayed, you can show more modals, but they will be displayed below the overlay. Overlays are displayed below uh, system UI elements, like if the system shows like an alert dialog for permissions or whatever, it's below that. And you can absolutely we use it for in-app notifications as well. You can do that. Sure. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, there is a thing bothering me. For example, we have a component which was mounted and needs uh, some data from the server. When a component fetches this data, the title of the screen should be updated. Mm -hmm. Can it be done from the component, or should it be uh, somewhere in the navigation configuration? All right. So, so the question uh, was, if we have a component, a screen with a dynamic title which needs to be fetched from the server, how should we approach this uh, this uh, scenario? So, you can fetch the if you can fetch the data before you show the screen, then that's one option, and then you can you can inject the title in the options you pass in the command. But if you can't do that, then what you can do is show, I guess you don't show anything if it's the title, but once the component appears on the screen, then 
contact the server, fetch the data, and then dynamically call navigation merge options to update those options. So the downside here is that there will be, I guess, one second when the user won't see the title. Um, and the last question, is there uh, some viable documentation? Because I tried using the React Native UI lib, and there is uh, shell documentation. Right, so the question was about documentation, uh, about UI lib, and I guess also for navigation as well. So UI lib's documentation is kind of hidden. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own separate web uh, documentation website. Uh, I'll, I'll post a link in the Meetup uh, group. Um, I, I think it's actually fairly good, uh, fairly well documented. Uh, our documentation is available also in a website, but and it's open source. You can edit the documentation file as well. It's. Uh, I know there are some things that are lacking, but we're improving it slowly, and also lots of users update the documentation themselves. I hope it will improve over time. But we do need to improve Thanks. that. Thank you. Hey, it's for you. Uh, you said that for, for the first version, you didn't have like a plan. So what you really want to do. So what's your plan now with the second version? And maybe said. All right. So the question was, if we didn't have a plan while writing the first version, what was the what was our plan now? So our plan was to basically learn on the lessons we've learned in the first uh, version. One of them was to decouple all of our w logic from the library and make it as generic as possible, which it is right now. And also to make it scalable, we couldn't accept any pull requests from users. And we had some very good uh, pull requests. And as I mentioned, the reason for that was lack of tests. So we really improved our testing infrastructure in the second version. We are also using uh, Detox for E2E, and our test suite runs on, on CI in each version. I think those were our main uh, goals for the second version, uh, tests for scalability and improved API. And we also added a few missing features. For example, the overlay was a generic way to support an API we had in the first version, which was show in-app notification. You could actually uh, call navigation.show in-app notification, and that was a pure Wix API. It was, a, a, that was, it was written according to the Wix product. So we, we removed that and introduced overlay instead. And again, uh, next steps can maybe be plans for version .3 or just uh, adding new features. And All right, so the way we work uh, in my company is that we do uh, these like roadmap meetings every quarter. So we just had, we just finished our, uh, our plan, our plans for the next quarter. I think the main feature that we're, we want to implement this quarter is the shared element transition. It's implemented. It just needs to be refined and improved. Um, and that's it. I'm, I guess we should, we should, uh, uh, post roadmaps for the library. Especially um, for open source, like absolutely. which area I should contribute to. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Um, so thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. As usual, drinks and food at the entrance and mingling. You are welcome to ask questions. And as usual, you are welcome to participate in the next meetup. Suggested of uh, just contact me, send me mail, talk to me. We would love to do this. Thanks. <laughs>